Welcome to Around San Diego. So glad to have you with me. I'm Jenny Day. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We do begin at the border. A federal judge blocked a rule that allows immigration authorities to deny asylum to migrants who arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border without first applying online or seeking protection in a country that they have passed through. But the judge delayed this ruling from taking effect immediately to give President Biden Biden's administration time to appeal. This rule is a key enforcement tool set in place by Biden after a COVID-19 based restriction on asylum known as Title 42 expired in May. Title 42 allowed the U.S. to expel millions of people starting in early 2020 to slow the spread of COVID. The judge's order will take effect now in two weeks. And the city of San Diego will soon enforce the unsafe camping ordinance banning encampments in certain parts of the city. The city says it is starting to clear some encampments that are blocking roads and creating a hazard for drivers. But some people we talk to say this approach won't solve the homelessness crisis. Where are folks going to go? We know that the city does not have enough shelter for the number of folks that um, currently need it. Yeah, the city says the ordinance is a tool to help clear the streets and direct people to resources. But critics say again, it will only push homeless people into different cities. Well, 17 people have died so far this year in Baja, California, eight in Tijuana from a disease carried by ticks. It's called Rixia, and experts say that you could show symptoms up to two weeks after being bit. Signs include fever, tiredness, or a rash. Fortunately, antibiotics are an effective treatment. It's also important to find the ticks and remove them as soon as possible. Yeah. Ticks can attach anywhere. They really like hairlines or behind ears or in armpits. Get a pair of tweezers and get as close to that skin that you can interface and to uh, pull straight out as hard as you can. Ooh, yuck. So yeah, they, according to the CDC, there are thousands of reported cases in the U.S. each year, but the mortality rate, thankfully, is less than 1%. Well, from technology to more manpower on fire lines, more than two dozen Marines are helping keep MCAS, MCAS Miramar safe from fires. 30 Marines are now part of the base's first ever hand crew designed to respond quickly to any fires on base. The hand crew supports the base's civilian run fire department using hand tools that can cut containment lines around fires and put out hot spots. They've already been called into action, fighting off flames at the base just last week. In terms of having somebody that's in shape and, you know, being able to work those long, hard hours and uh, working through a command structure, it's all built in. Yeah, for now, the Marine hand crew will only support incidents at the base, but after more training, they'll be certified to help out across the county. Now, while electric bikes are exploding in popularity, the number of e-bike accidents locally and nationwide are continuing to rise. Earlier this week, just hours apart, two people were seriously injured in separate accidents as they were riding e-bikes, one in Shelltown, the other in the gas lamp. As the number of e-bike accidents increase, so too do the calls for more e-bike safety regulations. One Sarah Mesa mom says that she would like more safety measures put in place here in San Diego. I'd love to have more um, driving safety lanes with those orange cones up where the, these cars are getting pretty fast. They're driving by pretty fast and it's dangerous for, for kids and just, you know, e-bikes riders. Local Assembly member Tasha Borner is now pushing for new statewide legislation that would require a license for e-bike riders 12 and over and also ban e-bikes for those under 12. Well, there are concerns over something being found on eucalyptus tree leaves around Scripps Ranch. They are called lerps, apparently, and some people are worried that they could create an increased fire risk. Our Steve Price is working for you to find out how concerned we all need to be. You'll find it on a lot of eucalyptus trees here in Scripps Ranch. What is it? And if a tree has it, is it more likely to burn during a fire? We're working for you to get answers. It's called LERP, and it's produced by the larva of psyllid bugs as a protective cover. 
Lert by itself isn't a problem, but the small insects that create it are a different story. They suck plant juices that can cause leaves to die prematurely and expose the tree itself to other diseases. We're standing right where the fire came through the first time. Bob Ilko was living in Scripps Ranch when the Cedar Fire roared through here in 2003. So he understands the concern now from neighbors who remember the LERP infested eucalyptus trees back then going up in flames. The LERP does cause problems. For one, it kills leaves that fall off the tree, land on the ground and dry out, creating dangerous fuel. The 2003 fire wasn't a canopy tree fire from tree to tree. It was so hot and quick and the winds were blowing that it was lighting the ground material on fire. Working for you, we reached out to the city of San Diego to see if they're aware of the growing lurk problem out here and if they're planning to do anything about it. They sent us back a statement saying in part, we will be dispatching our certified arborists from the urban forestry program to the location of concern to determine if the trees fall under city jurisdiction and if any tree maintenance is required. Bob, who is president of the Scripps Ranch Civic Association, fears this problem is too prevalent and too expensive for the city to aggressively go after. I can yell to the cows come home, but to, to treat uh, Tierra Santa and Scripps Ranch and part of Ranch Bernardo and, and Tecolote Canyon, I mean, the, the city isn't going to treat the, the LARP. It just isn't. So Bob's advice, do what you can do to protect your property and make it easier for firefighters to save your home. Create defensible space, trim trees away from your roof and clean up dead debris on the ground. In Scripps Ranch, Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, important info, Steve, thank you. Well, meantime, climate activists demonstrated earlier this week outside of Sempra Energy. That's the parent company of SDG&E. The protesters are demanding the company stop exporting and burning fracked gas. About 40 activists even stopped traffic for a while from moving down one lane of 8th Avenue as they created a large chalk drawing right there in the street. They were out there for nearly three hours demonstrating, calling on the White House to declare a climate emergency. They said the coral reefs weren't going to last another 50 years. They're not going to last 50 days at this point. This is beyond an emergency. Yes, Sempra released a statement to CBS 8 saying the company has a deep respect for the environment and that it's investing billions in safe, reliable and resilient networks to connect consumers to increasingly cleaner energy. Well, San Diego is hot right now. Just how hot is it, though? And what do you think is the hottest temperature ever recorded? And what's the hottest month? We sent CBS 8's Kirsten Holmes to find out. Okay, so it's hot outside, but is it really today across San Diego? It was only in the 80s, but if you were outside, you felt hot. But what is the hottest San Diego has ever been? And when did we get there? Here's what we found out. What's the hottest temperature recorded at the airport? I would say 105. I would say at the airport, probably about 90 degrees. 80s or 90s, like maybe like 85 to like 93. Hottest temperature recorded at the airport was 111 in 1960-something. All good guesses, but Julia, Andy, and Dylan all got it wrong. The hottest temperature ever recorded at San Diego International was on September 26, 1963. And can you imagine how hot that must have been walking across the tarmac? What do you think is the hottest month in San Diego? Mm. I'm going to go with July. Yeah. Good July. July or August? Both wrong. Oh, I would say August. September. Really? September? I can already smell the pumpkin latte for September. That doesn't sound right. It's right, but we were a little surprised ourselves. Thankfully, I got a friend, CBS 8's chief meteorologist, Carlene Chavis, to help bridge the heat gap for us. Carlene, it's hot outside, but I feel like it's been hotter, no? It definitely has been hotter. This is not even the hottest that we have ever been. Talking about September 1963, we got to 111. So a lot of our hot temperatures actually come around the time of Santa Ana winds, so that kind of falls a little bit more into the fall months. Wacky weather, it's definitely warmer than usual, but even over the next few months, we're still going to be dealing with heat. Experts like Carlene say what makes it feel so hot is how long the heat wave lasts, because the heat is lasting longer than usual and it's hotter than normal inland. And Carlene says, brace yourself because next week we're getting ready for more. 
it's still gonna be humid here. So everyone's gonna be like, oh my gosh, it's the hottest. No, it's not, it's just uncomfortable and I'm sorry. <laughs> You've been warned, so stay cool and hydrated out there, San Diego. Kirsten Holmes, CBS 8. Wow, 111 at the airport. No complaints, right? Today then. <laughs> All right, well, when you check your mailbox, you often see flyers and coupons mixed in with your letters and bills. In some San Diego neighborhoods, those advertisements litter the streets every week, whether they request them or not. So our chief meteorologist, who you just saw there, Carlene Chavis, visited a couple of communities where this isn't just an eyesore, but also an environmental issue. We're seeing more and more of these piling up in our neighborhoods. So basically you have this paper, it's advertisements on the inside. What is it slicked in? It's slicked in plastic. Plastic doesn't break down. And so this is an issue that we are seeing popping up all across San Diego County. And this is what it eventually turns into waste. So a lot of them land in the street, a lot of them land in the gutter, sidewalks. When it rains, they wash out to our storm drains, they wash out to our bays and beaches, and at some point we're, we're swimming in this stuff. And Dan would know. He rolls through his Bay Park neighborhood with a trash picker and bucket, just cruising through and ready to swipe up any that he finds that are not on private property. Which isn't hard because they are often found littering the streets. Thank you. Well, as if it was just thrown out of a car, it rarely makes it to the private property, so it's an advertisement. And you know, I kind of enjoy looking at a coupon every now and then too, but it's mostly uh, some businesses and grocery stores and it's paper, but the main thing is this plastic bag. And as you know, plastic film is very difficult to recycle. You can't put it in your blue bin. You actually have to collect enough of it and take it to one of your grocery stores and they usually have a bin. And then it's shipped somewhere and melted down and maybe made into a plastic chair uh, as a second life. That's Mark O'Connor with the Surfrider Foundation chapter in San Diego and a lead on the Rise Above Plastics program which works to eliminate plastic waste in our county. He and Dan want to stop the distribution of this plastic waste in San Diego. Dan isn't alone. People in this City Heights neighborhood are just as annoyed with the unwanted flyers. I can't imagine any other situation in which somebody could just throw trash at your house and that would be okay or authorized in some way. Shannon Starkey recalls the waste piling up around the time of the COVID lockdowns. And every Tuesday, fresh flyers slicked in plastic are added to the ones already lying in the streets. This is probably a couple weeks old here and it sits here and sometimes these go on. I mean, we just cleaned up the neighborhood and it's just perpetual. As soon as we finish picking them up, another week comes by and there's Another 17,000 pounds of trash in the neighborhood. Jess also lives in this City Heights neighborhood and is fed up. Jess, along with Dan, contacted the advertising company to opt out, but they said it didn't work. I contacted Veracast and they said, oh, you can opt out, but they're still delivering them even though you opt out. So I think it should be mandatory that you can't throw plastic bags into the street. It's littering, mm -hmm. um, and if somebody wants them, then they should opt in and they should mail it to you. This was pulled out of a storm drain right here. I reached out to the city attorney's office yeah, regarding this sidewalk. issue. I was informed that California Penal Code Section 556.1 states a business may distribute its advertising flyers in residential neighborhoods by placing them on the driveways, in the yards, or at the front doors of homes without the express consent of the residents. That shouldn't be in our waterways or our beaches. But each person I spoke with well, echoed I, uh, the same response. Most of the time, the flyers are not making it to private property and are polluting the streets and gutters, which is troublesome, especially during the rainy season. The city attorney's office advises them to consult attorneys about their legal rights with respect to the advertising company exactly. or companies involved. And I'm not even really sure if the businesses know that these are getting thrown into the street. I reached out to the environmental compliance manager with Vons and Albertsons, who advertises with Veracast a couple of times with no answer. I'm also waiting on a response from Veracast. But in the meantime, if someone's walking around, they see it in the street, they should pick it up. Like I said, people walk by it in their own driveway, but it'd be nice if someone could pick it up out of the street. That's obviously going the extra mile, but that would be helpful. Helpful indeed. For CBS 8, I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis. Yeah, good conversation to have, Carlene. Thanks. And Mark O'Connor with the Surfrider Foundation also suggests picking up the flyers, taking them to one of the stores that advertises with Veracast, and then asking that manager to stop. 
Well, San Diego police officers say they picked up several anti-Semitic flyers off of car windshields in the Allied Gardens area just this week. And this isn't the first time that San Diego County residents are seeing this. The flyers collected were found on Zion and Archwood streets. There were similar incidents earlier this year in San Carlos, Del Cerro and Santee. We talked to San Diego Police Lieutenant Adam Sharkey, who says this is not a hate crime, but they're calling it a hate incident and they will investigate. Leaving flyers in a public place on a on a vehicle parked in a public place, regardless of the content, unless it meets very specific thresholds, does not qualify as a crime as disgusting and as distasteful as that message might be. The gun control yeah, so the executive director of Stop Antisemitism disagrees with this act not being considered a hate crime. She there says that a case of physical assault shouldn't have to happen for them to enact hate crime laws. Well, the San Diego City Council just approved a $4.8 million settlement with the families of two men who were hit by a car right outside of Sharp Mary Birch Hospital in 2015. One of those men died and the other was left with severe injuries. Shannon Handy sat down with him and his attorney to get their reaction. Relieved. It's been a really, really difficult time to go through. Joseph Lopez still struggles with injuries he suffered following a crash outside Sharp Mary Birch Hospital in September of 2015. The automobile struck me on my right side, so starting with my fractured knee, uh, pelvis, broke most of the ribs on my right side. Uh, I broke my back at the T7. It happened on Health Center Drive. Lopez, his wife, her daughter, and her fiance, Jamie Leone, were there to visit a newborn niece. After parking their car, the women crossed the road first. Lopez and Leone followed. That's when they were hit by a car driven by a doctor. It was 8.20 at night. I'm not foolish, and at this point in my life, I know how to cross the street. And I did check, and there was nothing coming. I couldn't see anything. Aside from dealing with the physical pain, Lopez says losing Leonin has been just as traumatic. It's difficult for me because he was such a great guy. And I think when those things happen and you wake up and you find out that we lost him, my first initial reaction was, why him, not me? And I dealt with that for quite a while. In 2016, both families filed a lawsuit against the city of San Diego, arguing they were responsible in part because people had previously raised concerns about the area where staff and patients grew accustomed to parking and crossing without a crosswalk and where others had been hit before. That led to a civil trial, which ended this past May in a hung jury, with eight of the 12 jurors voting to hold the city liable, one vote short of the nine required. The families have been seeking more than $12 million in damages. Today, the city approved a $4.8 million settlement, eliminating the need for a second civil trial. We're one vote short of potentially costing them quite a bit more than what they are now paying out through settlement. After the crash, the city banned parking on the west side of Health Center Drive where the group had parked. Attorney Brett Schneider wishes it had happened sooner, saying he hopes this settlement will prevent another senseless tragedy from happening somewhere else in San Diego. There couldn't have been a cheaper, more common sense solution than what it took to make that roadway safe, which was just to put up no parking signs and to enforce it. That's it. That was our Shannon Handy there reporting. Now we did reach out to the city, but have not yet heard back. Well, right now we are learning that a project that would transform a golf course into a sand mine in Rancho San Diego is getting pushed back. People living in the area are concerned about the impact to the environment and their health. They say the proposed 200 acre sand mine would harm water quality and put dust into the air that could lead to valley fever. The truck traffic is going to be incredible. It's going to be a 147 uh, round trip truck hauling trips a day, and that's going to be um, a truck going by either to or from the facility every 1.3 minutes. Yeah, a spokesperson for the Cottonwood Project sent CBS 8 a statement. They say sand supplies would be gathered temporarily and environmental restoration efforts would be implemented quickly. They also say the project would help address San Diego's housing construction costs by providing sand locally. 
Well, a man from Poway convicted in a cold case rape and murder from 35 years ago has been sentenced to state prison. James Kingery received a 31 year to life sentence after he was found guilty of killing 26 year old Julia Hernandez Santiago in Carlsbad back in 1987. Prosecutors say that she was strangled to death. The case went cold for more than 30 years until Kingery was arrested on drug and weapons charges in 2020. A DNA sample from that arrest linked him to the 1987 rape and murder. Yeah, this viral video showing sea lions running toward people in La Jolla Cove is raising questions yet again about the lack of space that tourists and visitors give the marine animals. CBS 8's Rocio de la Fe spent, the, spent time at the cove to find out firsthand just how often people ignore warnings to stay away from these sea mammals. Despite warning from lifeguards and signs like this, interactions between people, seals and sea lions here happens on a daily basis. We spent the afternoon here and were able to capture dozens of people getting uncomfortably too close to the animals. Nature is beautiful, but it's good to view it from a distance. La Jolla Cove is one of the top tourist attractions in San Diego, attracting people from all over the world, trying to catch a glimpse of the marine life and landscape. But oftentimes people go too far or in this case too close to get their pictures. After spending a few hours at the cove, we saw person after person ignore warning signs and approach the seals, sea lions and their pups. At one point, we even saw this person kneeling to pet a sleeping pup. I definitely feel like there there should be a little bit more space. I can take plenty of pictures from up here. I can probably go down a little further, but being there's no there's no reason to be so close to them. Seems like they're kind of getting in the seals bubble. As soon as one group of people left, others would take their place and stand just feet away from the animals and their young. It's a never-ending cycle. In this video, you can see tourists taking pictures as a pup climbs the stairs. Watch as one woman gets startled by a sea lion after getting too close. Edward Gergi from Sacramento says he believes part of the problem is the lack of enforcement. There's nobody there to uh, guide the tourism away. One San Diegan who didn't want to go on camera told us he put these orange cones on the sand to keep people back, but you can see the crowds completely ignore them. No one's obeying that. One park ranger told us there's no law in place that states the distance people need to keep between the animals. Those we talked to say they wish people would be more respectful. It's beautiful, but uh, again, it's, uh, it's best to view from a distance. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. Yeah, it's one of my favorite spots. I love it. So let's just behave ourselves so that we can all coexist. So CBS 8 viewers are overwhelmingly also in support of the sea lions. On Facebook, Kathy Valderas wrote that they shouldn't allow people on that portion of the beach. The seals are just protecting their territory, end quote. Then Chris Porter wrote, and people wonder why aliens never visit. If you saw the way that humans treat other species, you'd stay away too. And finally, you see it there. Kathy Ziegler wrote, geez, get off of their beach. You can find more comments and share your own thoughts on the CBS 8 Facebook page. Well, the city of Chula Vista is moving forward with plans to buy a motel and turn it into housing for the homeless. The motel on Palomar Street would be the first in the South Bay to be converted into housing and safe parking for people living in their cars. It's going to cost the city $7 million just to purchase it, but another $6 million is needed to convert it. Mayor John McCann says that the timing is right because of grant money that's available to get the process going and be able to make sure that when people come in, uh, they can get the help they need and the services that need, but also have them vetted through our homeless outreach team. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, the people will be clean, uh, they will be sober, um, and they will be there to get the help that they need. Homeless advocates say the project is not effective. The project will now go into negotiations and it could take six to nine months for construction to start. Well, a new study shows a lot of wealthier Californians are leaving the Golden State and taking their money with them. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen finds out where they're going and why. 
Wealthy Americans are leaving California in droves, new data shows. A new analysis found that California ranks as the number one state with high income earners moving out. High income earners are moving in what's being referred to as the great wealth migration. New data from My e Listing, an online resource for commercial real estate, provides insight to the current lifestyle trends. They ranked U.S. states based on several factors, including tax laws, economic prospects, and lifestyle offerings. Here are the top nine states with the most significant net negative outflow of wealth ranked. In other words, this reflects which states high earners are leaving the most. California comes in at number one with a staggering net loss of $343.2 million, according to recent IRS data. Why? Many high-income earners are fleeing the Golden State due to skyrocketing income tax rates and high cost of living, making it a less desirable destination for wealthy Americans. The study also finds this could impact job creation as high-income earners play a role in business expansion. On the other side of the coin, high-income earners are relocating to these three states, Florida, Texas, and Arizona. Florida has a net income income migration of $12.4 billion. A main reason? Florida has no personal income tax. Also rounding off this list, wealthy Americans are moving to Colorado, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Utah, and Georgia. So that begs the question, are you staying in California or are you moving? Let us know on social media. I'm Ariana Cohen reporting for CBS 8. <laughs> I cook really proud the food that we do. I put the standards of the Mexican food really high. Yeah, North County Restaurant is the newest recipient of a Michelin star, one of the highest honors in the dining world. So Valle opened in Oceanside less than two years ago, and CBS 8's Shannon Handy now gives us a tour and explains what makes this award so special. Not only is Valle the only restaurant in San Diego to get a new Michelin star this year, but it's also just one of seven Mexican restaurants in the United States that has one. Located beneath the Mission Pacific Hotel in Oceanside, Valle is a Mexican fusion restaurant that has done more in less than two years than most restaurants do in their lifetimes. First of all, it's a validation for all the hard work we have been doing since we opened. Chef Roberto Alcocer opened Valle in the fall of 2021. He and his family moved to North County from Baja, Mexico, specifically with the goal of earning a Michelin star, something not offered in his native country. Even though it's a really gastronomic country, the Michelin guy hasn't arrived yet to Mexico. And I start my life as a cook in France, where I started in a Michelin star restaurant. So for me, that was my dream. The name Valle represents the Valle de Guadalupe region where 95% of Mexico's wine is produced. It's also where you'll find farm to table dining experiences where what's local and fresh dictates what's on the menu. That's what you'll find here, a multi-course tasting menu that changes periodically along with an ambiance that is both high end and comfortable. Everything inside the restaurant from napkins to plates are either inspired by or made in Mexico. And he designed and made the whole flatware for Valle. Valle's tasty menu starts at $165 per person. Signature dishes include the charred onion tart, agua chile, and the bronze dessert. Has orange, bergamot, cardamom. You can enjoy the food inside the main dining area or outside on the oceanfront patio. There's also a private room as well as a chef's table located in the kitchen or what Chef Alcocer refers to as the heart of the restaurant. That's what you can do with food and you connect with people. Valle now joins four other restaurants in San Diego that have Michelin stars, the only one of which offers Mexican cuisine. As for what's next, Chef Alcocer says while he plans to open more restaurants, for now he's focused on welcoming people to Valle and ensuring they come back. If they are taking the time to come in here, I have to take the time to be here for them and over exceed their expectations. Valle is open Wednesday through Sunday, 5 to 9 p.m. Reservations are highly recommended. For a link, just go to cbs8.com and click on this story. Reporting from Oceanside, I'm Shannon Handy for CBS 8.
Wow, looks incredible, Shannon, thank you. Well, a San Diego based company is quite literally elevating Padres games to new heights. Our Jake Gariani has more on epic drone tours and how they're adding a new element to the Friars TV broadcast and in game experience. This is the number one ballpark in America, hands down, and it's really the best way to show it, is to show the entire place from the sky. Jake Gariani here at Petco Park with Jack Spitzer, the man behind Epic Drone Tours. Jack, thanks for joining us. First of all, you guys have been working with the San Diego Padres, providing drone shots for them. How has that been? It's been amazing, by far the best project that we've done. I've been a lifelong Padres fan. Uh, my business partner, Zach, we both have season tickets. And to be able to gain the Padres as a client and start working with them and provide these amazing shots for all the thousands of fans that watch has, has been really awesome. In your wildest dreams, when you and Jack and everybody started after Drone Tours, did you ever picture yourself here at Petco Park working for the Padres? Maybe in like five years. <laughs> uh, when we finally actually got that first gig to come through, it was like huge excitement. We were just totally stoked and just it was a blessing. So how did this come about? I've heard there's some fun story behind how you got in with the San Diego Padres. It was just a long series of cold emails being sent around, um, you know, to the season ticket reps, to a bunch of other people, and, you know, just trying to find someone that I could get a hold of and talk to about it, since I knew what we could provide, and that the Padres should be using these amazing shots that are, you know, modern day technology that everyone should be using. And finally, we got a hold of them, and we were able to make it happen. See, persistence, kids. Keep trying for your dreams. This is unbelievable. Really enjoying the drone tonight. The announcers for the Padres specifically calling out how amazing the drone shots are, that was just amazing to us because we had no idea they were going to do that. And that just, like, raised the excitement level even more. Yeah, Petco Park in San Diego, just a glorious day here today. A lot of the shots you guys are providing for these games are live right there. I mean, they're taking the drone as it's flying, right? Yep, so we, our pilot has comms to the broadcast booth where they're talking directly to them and saying, oh, this shot's awesome. We're going to cut to that right at, you know, start of the third inning. Yeah, bees on them. I like to have an ST. The entire broadcast production team has been super supportive of us, getting us the clearances with both the FAA, the MLB, and all of the things that go on behind before the shoot can even happen. And they were all for it. This is amazing getting to work with organizations like the Padres and continuing to, to do more and more of that with, with more teams and especially the Padres here at the best ballpark in the world. Best ballpark in the world. I will absolutely agree with that. Go Pods. And Jake's th Jake, thank you to you as well. Before we go, take a look at these cute new additions to the San Diego Zoo. Earlier this week, the zoo welcomed four capybara pups born to Rosalina and Bowie. Capybaras are precochleal, which means that they are more mature and mobile at birth. So the four babies are already nursing and following mom. The new youngsters are at the San Diego Zoo's Elephant Odyssey, by the way. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. I'll be back next week with more. Take good care of yourself.